questions? Okay, so today I'll start discussing the standard model. Okay, and it will basically be an application of what we have learned so far. So first, let me write down the gauge group. So this transfer will be SU3 times SU2 times U1. U1 is like a natural fit. But besides this, it has an SU3 component and an SU2 component, which means that we have to introduce the corresponding gauge fields. So the SU3 gauge fields are denoted by V mu, which will be V mu ATA. So these are the generators of SU3. This one will be denoted by C mu, which is C mu A, I'll call this LA. Okay. These will be the generators of SU2. And this one I'll denote by a single gauge fit S mu. Okay, no component. Okay. Now, these the generators you can take to be in the fundamental, but from whatever we are going to say, it doesn't really matter whichever generator, whichever representation you take these, because when you define covariant derivatives, you will always use the representation matrix for these generators. Right? Acting on any field, it will be the representation matrix of these generators. The action of the theory will take to be so action of gauge fields. Okay, there will be many more components of the action. So this will be minus one over four one squared. are defined in various things. So G mu mu will be del mu Because when you take the trace here, it will get a half delta ID, right? If you write this as, so this you write normally as G A mu nu TA. This will write as uh, H 
Now, before I go on, I'll describe some convention about the U1 charge. Convention about U1. So, suppose the alpha of x is a U1 transformation. I take the transformation of S mu and S mu goes to S mu minus S mu alpha. And I'll do this in order to be consistent with the corresponding conventions for non-abelian gauge space. It doesn't matter how you define. Okay, this sign earlier we have been taking plus del mu alpha, I've now changed the sign to minus del mu alpha, right? So it's like instead of alpha, we're calling minus alpha on the one. Okay, so this will be the transformation law of S mu. And then a field psi of hypercharge y. So hypercharge is what is the what is the U1 charge? Hypercharge y. This is the U1 charge. This will transform as transforms as psi goes to e to the power minus i alpha of x y times psi. Okay. So this is the definition of a hypercharge. If the field transforms e to the i alpha times psi, we'll say it's a hypercharge minus one. Okay, so you assign the hypercharge by this definition. So with this definition, the covariant derivative of psi will have the following structure. It will have a del mu psi minus i y s mu psi. And then we'll also have minus i d u a r a of d a psi minus i c u a okay, so these are the standard definition of covariant derivatives that we had used earlier for the non-abelian uh, gauge space, so we are not changing anything there. This is the definition of covariant derivative if the field carries hypercharge y. Yes. How the electric charge is We'll talk about it. We have not even said how the electric charge comes from here, right? So that we'll discuss later. Okay, right now the y is just defined as the charge under the U1 uh, gauge field. Okay. And his definition is by through the transformation of psi, which is psi goes to the minus i alpha of x y times psi. Okay, y is some number. And you can check, let's check that this agrees. 
So d mu psi, so del mu psi will go to minus i. So del mu psi will have an extra piece which is minus i del mu alpha times y. Okay. And then s mu will get an extra piece because of this minus sign. That will become plus i y del mu alpha <coughs> times i. So those will cancel. Okay. You have to make sure that the covariant derivative is defined in such a way that the piece involving del mu alpha cancels. Right? Because that's the only bad part. Otherwise, it will, uh, it will be a, um, uh, that the space factor will come in the front. So with this definition, del mu psi picks up minus i del mu alpha y, and this picks up plus i del mu alpha y. Okay? Because this minus sign combines with this minus sign. Why is the value introducing a charge y for different mu and not the other? Because for the others, the analog of the charge is the representation in which it belongs to. How it transforms, right? That information is contained here. Okay, so these are the analogs of the charges for the other fields. Okay. And you can see that while for the other fields, the charges are discrete, right? The representations are, I mean, there are only discrete set of representations. For U1, it looks like a charge is continuous, so I can take any value. Okay. But yes, this is true for. Uh, U1, but the group can also be non-compact group. Okay, if the group is not compact, see here y is cannot take any value in principle because if you take for example alpha as 2 pi, okay, if you demand that it will be 2 pi i alpha times y is 1, okay, because if alpha equal to 2 pi is the same as alpha equal to 0, right? Then y has to be an integer. Okay. We will not assume that this u1 okay, has period 2 pi. Okay. If the u1 has period say 2 pi times some integer. Okay. Then this y has to be 1 over that integer times an integer, right? It will be some rational number. For u1 gauge fields, okay, if it's really compact, right, which means that there is a periodic identification. They are what you can say is that the ratios of the charges should be rational numbers. This is because suppose alpha has this periodicity. Suppose alpha x and alpha x plus some numbers, you see, are the same. This is what I mean by a compact group, right? That if you, you uh, use the phase, but when the phase takes a certain value, it's thought of as an identity matrix, right? Suppose alpha x and alpha x plus c are the same. Then this will mean that c times y must be 2 pi. Okay. So y C times y C times y should be 2 pi times n. So why not pi? Because in quantum mechanics, psi and minus psi. I mean, okay. See, these are fields, right? Okay. These are, you are not talking about wave functions. So as wave function, psi and minus psi are in general distinct. So if you take alpha to be c, then c times y should be 2 pi times an integer. Right? So y should be. 2 pi times an integer divided by c. c of course can be anything, right? I mean, you don't know what c is. So this doesn't put constant on y as such. But if you take different particles, their ratios, right? Each of those have to be 2 pi of some time, some integer divided by c. So their ratios should be rational numbers because it will be ratios of integers. So for compact u1 groups, the charges, the ratios of the charges of u1 should be ratios of integers, should be uh, rational. Okay. That is what is observed in nature. Okay, we will write down the hypercharge assignments, the y assignment for various fields. Okay. So that indicates that the group okay. U1 okay, is really a compact group. Okay. So can we assign some charge to some particle, some fundamental Yes. Other will be some integer times that charge. No, you don't know whether that fundamental particle carries one unit of charge, right? Yeah. So fundamental yeah. particle could carry three units of charge. Yeah, it's some units. Yes, but the others could have two units of charge, right? So the, that's why for u1, right, there may be a minimal unit of charge. Everything which is a multiple is a multiple of that. But there might be any particle which carries that charge. Right? So it's not necessary that uh, if all charges are multiples of some number, 2 pi over c, okay. there need not be a particle which carries actually 2 pi over c charge. Right? So that's not uh, necessary. So all you can say is that the ratios of charges should be integers. They should be rational numbers. Okay. And as you see, this is what you observe in nature. Okay. When you ask, actually assign the y values, okay. this is what you find.
So the y, it will not be two pi. Okay? Because you will see that the y is not integer in general for various things. Okay, so this change in psi i, psi i, we did just to make sure that this minus sign is common within all of them. Okay, it's just a purely a matter of convention. Okay, that's it. So, sir, then we have to find t then. Outside can also Okay, the point is that you will never be able to find c because suppose we <laughs> conclude that all charges are multiples of something. Okay? Nobody guarantees that when you go to very high energy, you will not find a particle which carries that something divided by some integer charge. Right? That will be perfectly consistent. Right? Because it's just that you know, observed particles so far may carry integer multiple of say all even charge. But there will be other particles which carry odd charge which are very heavy and you have not seen. Right? So if you, once you have a theory, right, of course then you know what the charge assignments are. Okay, or what is the minimal unit of charge. But just based on the observation, you know, we cannot figure out what is the minimally one charge that a system can carry. Okay, so in the standard model, we'll have a certain number of particles. Okay. Those particles all carry some uh, integer units of some multiple, okay, integer multiple of some charge, it's a hypercharge assignment. But without any further uh, input into the theory, you would know that there is not any uh, another heavy particle which you have not seen so far, which carries a different kind of charge. And all you know is that the ratio should be rational. Is this okay? So this is special to this U1 final group. And all the other groups, right, non abelian groups, their representations are all classified, discrete representations, right? So there, there's a confusion. Okay, the only freedom that you have there is addressing these coupling constants, okay, which will measure the physical charge. Now, as it stands, all of these gauge fields are massless, okay, at least in perturbation theory. So how many gauge fields do we have? We have an SU3 which has eight generators, right? so eight uh, gauge fields from SU3. SU2 has three generators, so three gauge fields from SU2 and U1 has one. Okay. It will turn out that these SU3 gauge fields will be responsible for strong interaction, okay, that U1 and the SU2 gauge fields together will be responsible for weak interaction. Now, what you know from experiment is that the strong interaction gauge fields, the gluons, they are perturbatively massless. So, for those, just the gauge field action that you have written down is sufficient. The photon is also massless. Okay? So, for the photon also, we can have a massless gauge field. But the weak interaction uh, uh, gauge fields are not massless. Okay? They are known to be massive experimentally. And hence, as it stands, this theory cannot describe weak interaction. Okay, so you have to do something to make it uh, compatible with weak interaction. Okay? And the way we will make it compatible with weak interaction is give, by giving masses to some of the gauge fields by uh, Higgs mechanism, okay? by the procedure that we described. Is this clear? Now, a natural guess would be that the U1 that we have, that describes the yeah. photon, okay. and the SU2 is responsible for the Higgs, uh, for the weak interaction. Okay. It turns out that that's not the case. Okay, we'll see how exactly it works. Okay. But the way it will work is not that the SU2 gives the weak interaction, the U1 gives the electromagnetic. Okay, it's uh, a little more complicated. And again, we know this because we compare with experiments. Okay, there's nothing wrong in writing, writing down a theory where SU2 is spontaneously broken and U1 is unbroken. 
Okay, so that's, that's not something that agrees with the experiment. Okay, so you now introduce a Higgs field. A Higgs field, a scalar field. I'll call it a scalar field. Phi. And this will be in singlet of a sutri doublet, the doublet means spin half or isospin half, isospin half of a su2 and carry it Well, it's guesswork in the sense that you could also try to break with a triplet or with uh, multiple triplets. Okay. But it says that the experiment doesn't agree with this. Yeah. yeah. So it's uh, determined by experimental uh, input. Okay, how you should break it. Okay. So the idea is that ultimately we want to give this field a vacuum expression. So that indicate that um, shows why you have chosen to be sing it also to be singlet of SU3. Where if it was transforming under SU3, and if you gave it a vacuum expectation value, then not all of SU3 can be unbroken. Right? Some SU2 generator acting on the field will give a non-zero answer. Right? If it transforms non-trivial under SU3. Right? That's the meaning of transforming non-trivial, right? There was some generator which acts which doesn't give you zero. So that is the reason why you have taken to be singlet of SU3, which means it doesn't couple to SU3, it's neutral under SU3. Is this clear? Yeah. We have taken this to be doublet of SU2 because you want to break SU2. But you can also see that you have taken it to carry hypercharge minus 1, okay. which means that you are also going to break hypercharge, break the U1 symmetry, right? Because if the field acquires a vacuum expression value, then the U1 symmetry acting on the field doesn't give you back the same configuration, right? Or the U1 generator acting on the field will give you a non-zero result. So the U1 must be broken. Is this clear? So let me now be more specific. So because it carries, it's a doublet of SU2, it must carry an index okay, which takes two values, right? Upper index, upper uh, component and lower component of the doublet. So I'll denote this by phi alpha, phi alpha, alpha equal to one and two, or I can write as phi as phi one, phi two, I should have said I introduce a complex scalar. Complex scalar. Okay, with phi taking two components. Okay, so each of phi one and phi two are complex. So let's try to write down an expression for dmu phi alpha. So any guess as to what it should be? First term I'll write now, tell me phi alpha, right? That's always there. Then what? Plus i s mu phi alpha, okay. i s mu phi alpha. This is the U1, right? This plus i because hypercharge is minus one and they have a minus i y, right? Okay, then uh, alpha index should be over for the whole S mu phi x. Over? Well, the body S mu doesn't act on the alpha index. 
right? Because SPU is identity matrix as far as the alpha beta space is concerned. Because it's E1, right? So okay, okay, okay. each component has the same E1 chart. Okay, that's why it's for about this one? This one is zero, right? Because this is SU3 generator, right? SU3 generator acting on size zero because it's a singlet. This one will be there, right? And this is fundamental, so I just write minus I CNU PA alpha beta phi beta. Sorry, LA. Charge. See, the charge information is all inside the representation. Is that number is zero for that matter? So it's under which the charge forming. Yes. And then some kind of goes away from that. So you say that it is not charged under that transformation, so that term won't be taken. Then they do the singlet. Yes. So that charge coefficient is given there. Oh. In terms of BMU, the charge coefficient is not there because the we have put a one over G square in the candidate term, right? So once you make normalize that, right, that G will come and sit on in front of this. Is that clear? That's the way the interactions uh, arose, right? Because the way you have written the candidate term, there's a one over G one square, one over G two square, one over G three square. Right? If you want to normalize the candidate term, you absorb that G inside uh, in the definition of the gauge fields. Okay, and then that comes and sits. Yeah. So in this form, there is no charge information here. So Y basically plays the role of these representation matrices. But unlike these representation matrices, which are discrete, Y for a non-compact group can be just a continuous value. You can take any uh, value of Y. For a compact group, it's discrete, it's multiple of some uh, lowest charge, but we don't know what that lowest charge. Doublet under SU2, yes. So uh, is it because uh, you want to give SU2 as some massive? Uh, That's right, yes. Because you want to make the SU2 gauge fields massive. Okay. So it can be similar under SU3 or some global uh, symmetry can be under SU3? The point is if it carries SU3 uh, representation, right, then it's impossible to have once phi gets a vacuum expression value, some generator of SU3 will give non zero result acting on that. And once that generator gives non-zero result, the corresponding gauge field will become massive. Okay, so if it transforms non-trivial under SU3, then at least some generators of SU3 will become massive. Or some gauge fields such as SU3 will become massive, right? And we don't want that. That's why you have taken it to be a neutral under SU3. It is sure that in, uh, all the generators of SU3 are massive. Yes, that we know from experiment, right? Because that's what strong interaction uh, tells us. Okay, and strong interaction is formulated in terms of the massless gauge fields. Okay. This is again a perturbative statement. Okay. In perturbation theory, it's massless, and that's what we are doing here. Okay, now, so the action for the phi is integral minus integral d mu phi dagger this is the standard candidate term. And then there is a d phi minus d phi. And for d, I'm going to take <coughs> minus nu square phi dagger phi plus lambda phi dagger phi square. Okay, this is similar to what we discussed last time, but in the abelian context, okay, minus mu square phi dagger phi. But this I can also write as lambda times phi dagger phi minus d square whole square minus mu square whole 
lambda where b is well let me just put this in there. Okay, this is just a convenient way of writing the safe potential. Okay, all I have done is that I have just completed the square here. Yeah, so lambda phi dagger phi minus b square whole square. Okay, b is you can check is exactly this. And then I have just a second. Yeah, I think this is but this doesn't sound correct, right? Because okay, you can check what b is. 2 lambda v square, 2 lambda v square, so we will u square, right? Yeah, I think this is correct. 2 lambda v square, so we will u square, so v is square from u square by 2 lambda. Just comparing this with this. Now, from this form of the potential, it's clear that the potential the, it has a minimum when phi dagger phi is equal to v square. Right? Because it's a, comp, it's a square plus a constant. So clearly the potential has a minimum when phi dagger phi is v square. This is v to the 4, right? v to the 4 will give a v to the 4 over yeah, 4 lambda square, 1 lambda goes away, and that is calculated by this. Okay, but this constant is not too relevant for us. Okay, it's just a constant addition to the potential. No, I think there's a lamp. This lambda cancels of that. One lambda from the denominator, so it's um, u square over four lambda. We'll do four over four lambda. So this is okay. When phi dagger phi is equal to v square, we have a minimum. Now, of course, there are many different ways you can satisfy phi dagger phi equal to v square. Right? Take phi to be any vector such that mod of the first square plus mod of the second square adds up to v square. That's a uh, uh, lot of different vacua. But you can easily check that all of these different vacua, okay, different minima, are related by symmetric transformation. Okay, by SU2 transformation, you can go from any one to the any, any other one. SU2 as well as the U1 transformation. Okay, in fact, just by SU2, you can go from any one to any other. So you can pick any uh, one uh, vacua any one minimum, and the physics will be identical, right? Because they are all related by symmetry. Is this clear? Yeah. So we'll choose phi to be v zero. Yes. So if you further write d mu phi dagger, right? I'm thinking of this as a two-dimensional vector, and yeah, so that's some row. Similarly, in phi dagger phi also alpha index is here. Right? This is really phi alpha star phi alpha square. This is phi. Okay, so you have chosen phi to be this. And now you want to understand what the corresponding physics is. Okay, now of course, what you can do, okay, if you didn't know anything about spontaneous symmetry breaking, etc. 
what you can do is we take this to be the minimum we add small fluctuation we add chi and this is chi and chi we are on both complex fields put it in lagrangian in the action and expand in parts of chi and psi right that will uh, give you the full lagrangian so here there you have to diagonalize your chi uh, term by analyzing the gauge fields and so on okay. so if you do that you will eventually discover how many gauge fields are massive how many gauge fields are massless okay. just by following exactly the same procedure that we did earlier okay just substitute it and expand But let's try to see if we can guess what the structure is without doing the detailed calculation. Okay. And for that, we'll use a general result that we mentioned last time. Okay. That whenever a symmetry generator is broken, right? Whenever a T, okay, some generator that acting on the vacuum exposure value gives a non-zero result, okay, the corresponding gauge field gets mass. Right? That's what he said. So for broken generators, the gauge field is mass <coughs> massy. For unbroken generator, the gauge field is massless. Okay, so let's try to see how the different generators act on this vacuum exposition part, right? Which are broken, which are unbroken. Is this here? So first, we have L1, L2, L3. L1, L2, L3. So L1, I can take this to a polygon. Right, L1, L2, L3, I can take this to Pauli matrices. In fact, half of Pauli matrices, if you want to normalize properly. So this is like 0, 1, 1, 0. L2 is half of 0 minus i, i, 0. L3 is half of 1, 0, 0 minus 1. Now we have another generator, Y. Okay, we didn't write it as a generator because it's just a single number. Okay. But it's acting on both components, right? So we can, in principle, write as a matrix. Okay. This is what we did, that when you have two different spaces, right? you can combine them and write as a big matrix. Okay. So what will be the form of Y in this, in this two-dimensional notation? It's minus one, minus one, right? Because both components have y charge minus one. Is this clear? Okay, so y takes value minus one, minus one. Now you can see that take any of these, any of these four generators, apply on B zero. You will get non zero result. 0, 1, 1, 0. What does it do on P0? It gives you 0. Right? This one acting on P0 gives you I, or 0 I. This one gives you V0. This one gives you minus V0. Right? So none of the generators by themselves preserve the value. But from this, we cannot really conclude that all symmetries are broken. Because a general a generator is a linear combination. Right? So it may happen that individually, even though all individual generators are broken, okay, some linear combination may remain unbroken. Right? So if you are looking for what generators remain unbroken, okay, what you need to do is that we take a most general linear combination of all the generators, okay, apply it on the vacuum, and see if we can solve that this is equal to zero. Right? That will determine whether any generator is unbroken. Pardon? Yes. Yes, V by 2, 0. Yes, that's right. So all of these are half. Yes, all of these are a factor of half in all of them. Okay, so let's try to do this, okay? So we take 
a general linear combination Let's take a general linear combination. A1, L1 plus A2, L2 plus A3, L3 plus A4Y. So this is given by A1, L1 will give you A1 by 2, A1 by 2. A2, L2 gives you minus i a2 by 2. Pardon? Yes. So we will find, try to find uh, a1, a2, a2, a2. We will see if there is any, any solution. If there is more than one solution, then both generators will be unbroken. Any combination of a1, a2, a3, a4, which can leave, which can give 0, will be a unbroken generator. It may happen that the only solution is all A's are zero. Right? Then all generators are broken. Okay? So the general procedure is that you take an arbitrary linear combination of all the generators, apply it on the no, no, uh, uh, vacuum expression value, and see if you can find a solution that that is equal to zero. A3, L3 is going to do A3 by 2 minus A3 by 2. A4, L4 is minus A4, minus A4. So we now apply it on V0, and if we see if we can solve for it to vanish. So the equation that we want to solve is A3 by 2 minus, sorry, here. <coughs> by 2 minus a4, a1 by 2 minus i a2 by 2, a1 by 2 plus i a2 by 2, minus a2 by 2 minus a4, acting on e0 is 0, 0, 0. No, that, that's if you are applying group elements, right? Here you are applying generators, right? It's one plus this is a group element, right? So the one gives you already a V zero, right? So the change is what you are looking at, and change should vanish, right? So this you should distinguish between these two, right? Because a group element acting on the vacuum should give you the vacuum itself. But the generator acting on the vacuum should give you zero because group element is one plus minus i times the generator, right? So the one has already given the original solution. So this equation can be written as a3 by 2 minus a4 on v and v is equal to 0 and a1 by 2 plus i a2 by 2. Okay, a1, a2, a3, a4 are real numbers. <coughs> and you are sort of trying to solve for it for real values. Is this clear? Second equation it tells us that a1 and a2 must be 0. Right? That is why you can, this is a, there is i here, as long as v is on 0, a1 and a2 must both be 0. This one tells you that A1 should be A3 by 2. Sorry, A4 is here, A3 by 2. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Is this clear? So there is a solution. Well, See, given any solution, you can multiply it by a constant, right? It's also a solution. So there is only really one solution. 
because the overall constant, yeah. right, you can always adjust. Okay, so yes, I mean, you can call it infinite solution, but it's really one solution. Because this is a homogeneous equation, right? So this tells us that L t plus y by 2 or any linear combination of that, any multiple of that. L t plus y by 2. Why? Because f4 is equal to x3 by 2, right? So this combination, this becomes f3 and f4 are the only non zero ones. So f t times L t plus y by 2. That f t L t plus f4 is x3 by 2. So L t plus y by 2. So L t plus y by 2 preserves that. So this means that when we expand the gauge fields, we have uh, okay. These are separated anyway. Okay, so you have CMU one, CMU two, CMU three. Right. So you have CMU one L one plus CMU two L two plus CMU three L three. Okay. And because you are using two by two matrix rotation, I can always also write it as S mu. L or S mu y. Okay, now we are thinking of y as a two by two uh, matrix. <coughs> I, I propose not identity. Okay, because it, uh, it doesn't act on the S mu. So here, when you actually diagonalize, so what it is telling us is that when you substitute all this into the uh, gauge field, uh, into the d mu phi dagger d mu phi, right, and try to diagonalize the corresponding kinetic term for the gauge fields. What you will find is that there is a mixing term that tells you that we have to re-diagonalize between C mu 3 and S mu. Okay, it's not that the C mu 3 and S mu are separate objects. C mu 3 and S mu both start mixing with some component of the scalar field. And when you, at the end of this process, okay, what you will find is that some linear combination of C mu 3 and S mu remains massless. Okay, the S become mass massive. So you have to re-express this. This can remain as it is. This too, you can have to re-express this as uh, a mu. I have not used any, right? So a mu one times l three plus y by two plus a mu two and some other linear combination, independent linear combination. Okay. Some alpha L3 plus theta y by 2. Okay, it doesn't matter what linear combination you take. The important point is that this is the gauge field which will remain massless. Okay, what particular linear combination you need that you have to determine by looking at the details of the gauge field kinetic term. But this gauge field which multiplies L3 plus y by 2 because this generator is unbroken. When you write down the kinetic term or, or when you write down d mu phi dagger d mu phi, you will not find any mixing between this one and the scalar field. Right? Because the mixing between the, the gauge field and the scalar field came because the corresponding generator acting on the vacuum expression value gave a non-zero result. Okay, that was responsible for the quadratic term, right? Otherwise, you will give a quadratic and high, uh, cubic and higher order terms. Because this annihilates the vacuum, you will not get a quadratic term in following this gauge field, and hence this will remain mass. Is this point here? Okay, because the general result is that unbroken gauge group, unbroken generators are associated with massless gauge fields. So this gauge field will be identified as a photon. And this combination we identify as electric charge. Electric charge. 
start. Now, of course, we can take any uh, multiple of these and call this the electric charge. Okay, because uh, any multiple of this is also unbroken. Okay. But we will see that the normalization is such that this is the electric charge measured in units of proton charge. Or minus the electron charge, so which is the same. Yeah. Look at this identification, we will see later when we identify the charges of various known quantities. So, net result of this analysis then is that out of the four gauge fields that is coming from ACU2 times U1, it's free from ACU2, one from U1, one gauge field remains massless, that's the photon. The other three become massive. Okay. Those will give the W plus W minus and Z. Is this here? Yeah. Now, from the Higgs field, the scalar that we had, we had two complex scalars to begin with, right? Phi 1 and phi 2 are complex scalars, which is equivalent to four real scalars. Number of broken symmetries here are how many? Three, right? Out of four generators, three got broken, right? L1, L2, and this other linear combination, which is not this, got broken. Right? So for each of these broken generators, there would have been a Goldstone boson if it was not a gauge theory. Right? So there would have been three massless particles. But those three massless particles would get absorbed in the three massive gauge boson that you have found. Right? Because once you couple it to gauge fields, you have seen that the Goldstone bosons don't remain massless boson. They just get absorbed in the gauge fields. So those three scalars are gone. But because you saw that the counting of the degrees of freedom okay, remain the same, and because we had four real scalars to begin with, one real scalar will remain. Is that clear? So that real scalar is what is called a Higgs boson. Pardon? How is does that happen? Yeah. So the count. I am just giving the counting. Okay. If you want to see explicitly how it happens and calculate the mass of the Higgs, for example, what you have to do is to you have to repeat whatever we have done with this potential. Right? Diagonalize the gauge field uh, and uh, uh, scalar uh, candidate terms. Okay. Perhaps fix appropriate gauge okay. and see which are the mass uh, you know, physical particles left over. Okay. That will also give what the precise mass of the Higgs particle is. Okay. But what I am telling here is the way to count. Right? And the counting is simply that we have four real scalars to begin with. Right? We have we would have had three Goldstone bosons because there are three broken symmetries. Okay. And those three Goldstone bosons, by this process, by the uh, uh, Higgs process, got absorbed in the three gauge bosons. Okay. So three degrees of freedom from the scalar went into gauge fields. But one degree of freedom must remain. Right. And that degree of freedom will represent a massive scalar. Okay. That's what is called a Higgs field. Okay. If you want to know precisely what the mass of the Higgs field is, you can just carry out this analysis. Right? Because Lagrangian is completely given. Right? All you have to do is that you just substitute, as I said, the phi, you look at the fluctuation around phi as V0 plus psi and psi. Okay? Think of these as complex scalar fields. Okay? We still have four real scalar or two complex scalar. Expand that action and then fix gauge appropriately. Okay? And uh, analyze the spectrum. Okay. But, and is that okay? Right. So at the end, you will find the Higgs and its mass. Yes. It will be like the chi one field that we got in the previous. Yes. That's right. Exactly. It will be like a chi one field that we got in the previous analysis. Right. So we are like chi one and chi two. Chi two got absorbed, <coughs> but the chi one remained as a massive field. Right. So the Higgs will be exactly like the chi one. Now in this case, we can also. 
gets easily whether the Higgs is charged or in neutral. What is the guess? Under the electric charge. Neutral. Why is it neutral? Pardon? Singlet under? How do you know that it's singlet under L3 plus Y by 2? Yes. The point is, it's not always the case that, that whatever you are uh, uh, left over, whatever, whatever is left over will be remain unbroken. Okay? You could have, for example, added two such Higgs parts, two, two such objects, okay? and uh, uh, made a uh, general diagonal edge. Okay? They will all, you will get both neutral and charged particles. Okay? So one ought to see that in this case, there is no option, it's because the charged particle is complex. Okay? So uh, a complex scalar has two degrees of freedom. So that clearly shows that you cannot have uh, a complex scalar, okay, or a charge scalar. Okay. But another thing to do, to do the counting is that if you look at this form, right? These are the fluctuating fields, right? Chi psi. Now from this we can calculate the charges that these various things carry. They treat L3 plus Y by 2 charge. This is the unbroken group, right? So, chi will carry what? L3 plus y by 2, let me write L3 plus y by 2 is half 1 half 0 0 minus half plus minus half 0 0 minus half. So, this is 0. 0, 0, minus 1. Okay. I just added as a matrix. So, chi is chargeless. Psi carries charge minus 1. Okay. The electric charge that, carries, that is carried by chi, because this is the generator you are going to act on chi psi, right? Okay. This is an unbroken generator. Is that, is it clear? So L3 plus Y by 2 I represent as a matrix. Okay. This acting on phi, it doesn't do anything to this. Okay, that's how we have uh, defined it. So, and acting on this, it doesn't do anything, it annihilates chi, okay. which basically means that the chi is chargeless and psi has charge minus 1. Okay. So, to begin with, we then had one co neutral complex scalar, that is chi, and one charged complex scalar, that is psi. We can also calculate the charges of the broken gauge fields. Okay, there are three broken gauge fields, right? And you can check that two of them have a charge, they have charge plus minus one. One is neutral. So, in order to have, for a charged gauge field to become massive, it must absorb a charge, uh, charge scalar. See, the charge is conserved, right? This, D3 plus Y by 2, this is like a normal conserved charge, right? Nothing has happened to this. So if you are combining two fields to make a composite field, right? Like a gauge field and a, a massless gauge field and a scalar to become a massive gauge field, they better have the same charge, right? Otherwise, you cannot, uh, they cannot mix. So a charge gauge field requires a charge scalar to get uh, massive. A neutral gauge field requires a neutral scalar to become massive. So because you can check that the gauge fields are charged, the charge gauge field will require will absorb the charge scalar, so psi will be gone. Psi will be gone. This will be absorbed inside the uh, 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 charge gauge field, the W plus and W minus is by this uh, gold showing Higgs mechanism. Okay. And out of the two neutral, one of the neutral particles, the neutral Goldstone boson, will be absorbed because there is also a neutral uh, gauge field, massive gauge field. So the neutral massive gauge field is absorb the neutral Goldstone boson. The charge massive gauge field will absorb the charge Goldstone boson, and what is left over is one neutral scalar particle. Okay, that's how you are doing the counting, which is the checking that what is left is a neutral scalar. Okay. But again, if you don't want to go through this general argument, okay, you can take the standard model Lagrangian that I have given, okay, expand out, diagonalize, and you can see what 
particle remains a hot charge it carries, right? So how it transforms under the uh, <coughs> L3 plus 1 by 2. Is this clear? So I'll leave this as an exercise to work out the spectrum of the gauge fields on the Higgs field. Well, you can call it, but whether it has anything to do with the real electric charge, we don't know. Right? The point is, if you don't break, right, if the symmetry is not broken, then there is a U1 and an SU2, all are unbroken. Right? So you cannot make contact with what you see in nature. Right? You don't know which charge refers to what. That is only after breaking that you can say that the photon must be associated with the charge that is unbroken. Right? Because you know that photon is massless. Yes, because the language sometimes the book says that like it is said, why does it use that the neutral component of the Higgs and like not to use this five plus component? They write it as like the charge component, one component is five plus, and the other says there is five zero. Yeah, okay, I should have said that's a matter of convention, right? That how you define your five, right? So I have already written five so that the upper component gets a vacuum expression value. But of course, you can get a perfectly uh, 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 equivalent theory by giving the lower component of vacuum expression, right? Because they're all related by SU2. Right? That's what I said. There's a vacuum. There's a whole family of vacuum. Right? There's a whole family of vacuum. We can take V0 or 0V or AB, for example, right? With mod A square plus mod B square equal to V square. Right? All of these are equivalent choices of vacuum. Once you have chosen the vacuum, then you study the physics. Then whatever symmetric generator is unbroken, that you have to call the charge, electric charge. Right? So in the convention that I have chosen, right, I have taken the upper component to have a non-zero vacuum expression value, and in the convention for Y that I have said that what Y charge it carries, the unbroken generator turns out to be L3 plus Y by 2. Is this okay? No, but this can certainly be changed, right? But uh, by mm -hmm. changing the uh, vacuum expression value. I think L3 plus Y by 2 is a standard notation. But you can preserve that. Even if you give the lower component of vacuum expression value, if you redefine Y as minus 1. Right? You just have to, because that was our assignment, right? The fact that the Higgs field carries charge minus, you know, you know, hypercharge minus 1. Okay, I could have defined our hypercharge so that the Higgs field carries hypercharge plus 1. Okay, so L3 plus Y by 2 is a more standard convention. So that, that's why I have 
attack to preserve that. I mean, if I use the same definition of y, but given the lower component of vacuum expectation value, then the unbroken generator would have been L3 minus y by 2. Okay, so now the final ingredient of the standard model, okay. which are the formulas. Right? In fact, they are the ones that you observe. And w plus and W minus, so yeah, of course, now you observe, but those, those are not the ones which you had observed in low at low energy. So you have to now introduce the formulas, okay? And introducing the formula means we have to say how they transform under the standard model gauge group. Okay, that's what determines the kinetic charge. And then you have to worry about other kinds of interaction terms that the formulas may have. Okay, but the first thing you have to do is to write down the kinetic term for the formulas, okay? and that requires specifying what, how they transform. Now it turns out that the formulas are chiral. So I'll just spend some time reviewing what chiral formulas mean. and some of the properties that will be relevant for us. And then we'll move on to talk with this. So first ingredient is gamma phi. Okay, this gamma phi is defined as i gamma zero, gamma one, gamma two, gamma three. Okay. Let me remind you that our notation that we had been using is that gamma zero dagger is gamma zero, gamma i dagger is minus gamma i, gamma zero squared is identity and gamma i square is minus i With this notation, gamma phi is Hermitian. So let's check that. So gamma phi dagger, dagger is minus i, gamma 3 dagger, gamma 2 dagger, so this is minus i. Now these three daggers each gives a minus i. Right? So that's minus one cube. Gamma zero dagger gives a minus gamma zero. So minus one cube. Gamma three, gamma two, gamma one, gamma zero. So this gives you i, and now we are going to pull this gamma zero. We are going to reverse the order. Right? So first we pull gamma zero through this. Gamma is anti-coupled, right? So you pick up one, two, three minus sets by the time you have pulled gamma zero. That's minus one q. Then you pull gamma one through gamma two, gamma three. That gives you minus one square. And then you have to pull gamma two gamma 3, that's minus 1, times gamma 0, gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 3. So this is, my, this is minus 1 cube, minus 1 cube, so i, gamma 0, gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 3. <coughs> that's the same as gamma 5. Gamma phi square is one. Okay, these are like given the next slide. Okay, 
In fact, from the structure, it's clear that gamma cap square is either 1 or minus 1, right? Because after all, it's i square is minus 1 and then each gamma squares to plus or minus 1, right? And the commission is plus or minus 1. So if, if the choice is between minus 1 and plus 1, this one tells you that it has to be minus 1 plus 1, right? Because gamma 5 is Hermitian. So the square of a Hermitian matrix, okay, we better have all possible ideas. Okay, so then what else? So the fact that gamma phi square is 1 means that half 1 plus minus gamma phi to square it, you get the same. Okay, it's again straightforward. It's 1 quarter, 1 plus gamma phi square, that's 1. That's 1 plus 1 is 2, plus or minus 2 gamma phi. Okay, so that factor of 2 cancels the 1 quarter to make it half 1 plus minus gamma phi. Okay. So this means that 1 plus minus this, that this half 1 plus minus gamma phi is a projection of part. Is this familiar? Right? The, 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 this is what is used to define left handed and right handed formulas. Right? Because they are projection of parties. Okay. Okay. So this is this is the straightforward algebra, what I have done, I have done so far. So we'll define left-handed formulas. I am dissatisfied. That's I L is half one minus gamma phi psi. And if you bring it to the right hand side, to the left hand side, this implies that half 1 plus gamma phi psi L. Psi L. So psi L satisfies this projection condition. Okay, we will call a formula on left handed if it, when multiplied by half 1 minus gamma phi, it gives back itself and just by taking this on the right hand on the left hand side you can prove that half of 1 plus gamma phi psi is equal to 0 and similarly for right handed formula okay we have psi r equal to half 1 plus gamma phi psi r and this means that half 1 minus gamma phi psi r Well, assuming that there is a psi, there may not be a psi. You are thinking of the required Dirac formula. Right? You define its left and right handed components by applying half of 1 plus gamma phi 1 psi as the right handed component and half of 1 minus gamma phi psi as the left handed component. Suppose, okay, let's suppose that we had a Dirac formula and we have defined psi L and psi R that way. That psi L will have for the property like this. Okay? Because this square of this is 1, right? If psi L is half of 1 minus gamma 5 times psi, okay, where psi is a Dirac formula, then when we apply again one half of 1 minus gamma 5 on that, okay, 
because the square is itself, okay, we, it will satisfy this. Okay. But here I want to be more general, okay. that there may not be psi to begin with. Right? From the beginning, the Hormion fields that we are dealing with may be constrained by this kind of relation, right? or by this kind of relation. So these will be called left-handed formulas. And similarly, a formula which satisfies these constraints will be called right-handed formula. And as you will see, the standard model requires that we deal with left-handed and right-handed formulas. Okay, you don't have always a full formula in the Lagrangian. Is this definition clear? So these are formulas which you can write in a four-component form. But two of the components are related to two others by these relations. So then okay. effectively it has two complex components rather than four complex components. Okay, or two independent complex components. If we have four components, or only two are independent because this condition relates the two to the other two. Okay. So now we want to discuss some specific results involving these chiral formulas. So the first claim is that if we take psi L bar psi L, where psi L and psi L are two left chiral formulas, this is zero. Okay, so let's see how to prove this. Okay, prove in fact is not very hard. So psi L bar psi L is psi L dagger gamma zero psi L. That I just use the definition of psi L. Yeah, well, definition of bar. Okay. Now you see you have a relation like this, right? So I can replace high L dagger using this. So this is psi L dagger, psi L dagger half one minus gamma phi gamma zero psi L. And I'm using the fact that gamma phi is Hermitian. Gamma phi dagger is gamma phi. So psi L dagger. So this implies putting the dagger on both sides, okay. you get back half psi L dagger 1 minus gamma phi, right? Gamma phi dagger has become gamma phi. Gamma, uh, we are thinking everything as 4 by 4 matrix, right? There are two independent components, but just regard everything as 4 by 4 matrix. Psi L has two independent components, but you still think of it as a four component vector, right? Whose two components are determined in terms of the other two. Okay. There is a two component notation also for psi, okay? but you are not using that. We think of psi as a four component object, okay? but two components are related to the other two by this relation. Okay. Let's see, uh, gamma 0, gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 3. They are all uh, four component, four by four matrix, right? Gamma phi is a four by four matrix. Psi, so this equation will make sense only if you think of psi as a four dimensional column vector, right? The only thing is that the, this, once you have imposed this equation, two of the components have gotten related to other two. Okay, because this is a projection operator. It's a linear condition on the size, right? On the components, right? This or this, if, if in this form, Clear that you have a linear combination of these, right? So psi must be an eigenvalue vector of half one plus gamma phi with eigenvalue zero. Psi, right? So look at what are the solution is find that there are two linear combinations of the coefficients which must vanish. Okay. Four yeah, four dimensional column vector, yes. And psi L also we are going to take four dimensional column vector. Okay. 
Actually, well, whether it will be zero depends on the representation of gamma phi. Okay. If it so happens that gamma phi has a diagonal form of i minus i, then lot two components will be zero. Okay. But otherwise, it need not be that case. Right? Gamma phi may have a more complicated form, in which case the lot two components will not be zero. Okay. But even if the lot two components are zero, you just interpret this as a four component matrix, four component vector, whose lot two components are zero. Okay. But all manipulations are being done in the four component. Well, the constant is a lot of components are zero, right? So that's the constant. So the point is out of four, two are independent, right? Now, depending on the basis, right, that may mean that two components are zero, or the two components are determined now. So the other ones. Okay. So this is. Okay, so far. Now we are going to take gamma zero through this, and I, another property I forgot to mention is that gamma phi is also an exercise. Gamma phi gamma mu is minus gamma mu gamma phi. Okay, so gamma phi actually acts as a fifth gamma matrix. It's anti which is also the is this familiar? This just follows from the definite. Okay, if you take gamma 3, for example, okay, you can take gamma, gamma 3, of course, anti commutes with itself, right? And it anti commutes with well, three others. Okay, so you get a factor of minus 1 three times. Okay, it's already minus 1 cube that you will get. So that's why. So now, when you take gamma zero on this side, you get psi L dagger gamma zero, and it has become half one plus gamma phi psi L. Okay. Because gamma zero gamma phi is minus gamma phi gamma zero. But this, of course, is zero. Because this is left handed, so it's zero. So this is zero. Similarly, similarly, psi r bar psi r is zero. But psi r bar psi l is not equal to 0 and psi r bar psi l psi l bar psi r ok because for these if you carry out a similar manipulation you will get half 1 plus gamma phi psi r which is of course not 0 so what this is showing is that if you have only left chiral or right chiral formula, you cannot write a mass term. Because mass terms are terms of this type, psi bar psi, right? Or psi bar psi. So if, for example, if we just had a left-handed formula, right, psi L, then psi L bar psi L is identically zero. Okay, so you cannot write a mass term for such things. This will be important in what we are going to discuss. <coughs> Well, mass term under chiral transformation changes size. Right? Yeah, but that is broken. Yes, yeah, that's right. Yeah, this is a reflection of that. Yes, it is related, related to that. Yeah. But if you want to ask a similar question about a kinetic term. 
Can we write down psi bar i gamma mu del mu psi? Only using only left handed formula. Right? Does it make sense to write psi l bar i gamma mu del mu psi l? Is that question clear? That the answer is yes. So psi l bar gamma mu, tell me you can forget right now. Psi l, you can also also always add uh, derivatives on it. Gamma phi and derivative solve formula. So this is non zero integer. Similarly, psi r bar gamma mu psi r is not zero. But psi l bar gamma mu psi r is zero. Let's call it psi. Okay, what is true for psi will also be true for psi. And the proof is identical to what we did earlier, except that besides gamma mu, there is also a gamma mu, gamma naught, there is a gamma mu sitting in between. Right? So by the time you have taken this 1 plus gamma phi through the two gamma matrices, then it has come back to the original side. Okay, so let me just do it for one case and then we'll do some results here. So if we try to take psi L bar, gamma mu, psi L, this is psi L dagger, gamma 0. Gamma mu psi l, right? So this is psi l dagger of 1 plus gamma phi, gamma 0, gamma mu psi l. Now we will try to show that this is 0. Okay, if we are to check if this is 0. So we can only use the fact that this is a left handed object. So take this 1 plus gamma phi and try to act on psi l. But by the time you have moved to gamma zero, it has become half one minus gamma five. One minus, one one minus gamma five. One minus gamma five. Thank you. Yeah. Is left handed, so one minus gamma five. So by the time you have passed to gamma zero, it has become half one plus gamma five. But then when you have passed to gamma mu again, okay, it will become half one minus gamma five, right? And that acting on psi l of course is not zero. So this gives you psi l dagger of gamma zero. Gamma mu half one plus gamma phi phi l one minus gamma phi phi l so that's phi l bar gamma mu phi l okay so you get an identity okay and this means that in general there is no origin phi form this should be zero. So the kinetic term makes perfect sense just with left-handed formulas or just with right-handed formulas. A similar thing we can do for psi r. That for this we can check that this is also not zero. So kinetic term makes perfect sense okay, with just left-handed or just right-handed. In fact, one can also see that kinetic term cannot couple left-handed to right-handed. Okay, this will be zero because if just like this, you follow the same procedure. If there is chi r sitting here, right, we get half 1 minus gamma phi acting on chi r, and that is 0. Okay. So you cannot have kinetic term coupling the left handed to right handed. So these things you have to keep in mind when you try to formulate the theory by using chiral formulas, because that will, uh, these considerations will tell us what terms are possible to write, what terms are not possible. So maybe I'll stop here and tomorrow I'll introduce the set of formulas, okay, what representatives they transform in, and then you'll see what is possible, what terms you can possibly write and what terms you cannot write. Why chirality has been assumed? I mean. Why it has been assumed? Well, I mean, that's the way nature is, right? Uh, I mean, if you could certainly write, uh, write the introduced formulas which are non chiral. Right? After you fix the gauge fields, so you can uh, choose formulas to be non chiral, but it just doesn't agree, agree with what we see in nature. Okay. 
the interaction that is seen in Asia, that's tidal. So the weak interaction couples to tidal components, right? The left-handed components see weak interaction, the right-handed components don't. Okay, so for to accommodate that, that that's an experimental observation, and to accommodate that, we have to uh, introduce formulas in tidal representation. And I will see, for example, that for SU2, while the left-handed fermions will be doublets of SU2, the right-handed fermions will be singlets. And that also will tell us that you cannot write down directly fermion mass term because there is no invariant coupling between a doublet and a singlet, right? So we cannot write a, a quadratic term like psi L bar chi R. Psi L bar chi R is not zero by the general considerations, right? But because psi L bar is now in the doublet representation and chi R is now in singlet representation, you cannot write down a mass term for the formula. But for the if, if, uh, for uh, giving the neutrino to be mass, then one should have to introduce the right-handed um, neutrino field. Uh, yes. So in that case, uh, one can write the mass term. Right? Uh, then one has to write that the um, then one can say that actually the right-handed fermion is also a doublet under uh, SU2. Oh, see, the, the point that's not the case because even if you give the neutrino the mass, right, it still remains true that the weak interaction doesn't see the right-handed neutrino or the right-handed electron. The weak interaction doesn't see either the right-handed electron or the right-handed neutrino. So the fact that the neutrinos have mass means that you have to introduce some additional uh, fields, but doesn't mean that the theory becomes non-tidal. Okay. See, because if you start with a, a theory which where the left and right-handed particles couple in the same way, right, yeah. or in the same representation, that will mean that the right-handed electron and neutrino will couple in the same way to weak interaction as the left-handed electron and neutrino. Right? And that you certainly know is not the case. Right? The left-handed, uh, the right-handed electron and neutrino just doesn't see weak interaction. Means then we cannot introduce a right-handed uh, neutrino field. Means in some another way we have to. No, we can introduce the right-handed neutrino field. It will be singlet of the SU2 gas group. Okay, means left handed and right handed both have singlets of SU2. Not those no, no. two. No, left handed is doublet. Uh, right handed right is singlet. Okay, okay. Okay. But you give the neutrino a mass by generalizing the mechanism that you use for giving the formulas a mass. After all, quarks are not massless, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to see how to give the quarks mass eventually, right? But you cannot just write down a direct mass term in the Lagrangian. Okay. And the same story goes for the neutrino. Since it is a means experimentally observed fact that uh, suppose neutrino uh, in weak interaction means right handed neutrino we cannot introduce, and that's why you are calling because there no, is already. No, forget about neutrinos and electrons already, right? just take quarks. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Quarks have no problem, right? Both yeah, left yeah. and right handed quarks are there. Yeah. But nevertheless, yeah. when you couple the quarks yeah. to weak interaction, okay. the left handed quarks couple to weak interaction, right handed ones don't. Okay. So even for quarks, we have to introduce chiral forms. That the left handed quarks will be doublets of SU2, right handed quarks will be singlets. So it's not just that, I mean, as soon as we have the left and right handed fields both, then you can use non chiral formulas, right? Because the way the fields couple to gauge fields are different. So you'll see that even in the example of quartz, that's where it will start from, right? Mm -hmm. There's no problem uh, problem of not having the right-handed component of any quartz, right? All quartz have both left and right-handed components. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, <laughs> the fields that we'll be using are very different. Okay? And from that perspective, you can say it's an accident that quartz happen to be non tidal The basic ingredients will all be tidal Formulas, okay, left and right handed, and we we'll eventually have to see how they combine together to give non chiral ones. Right? Even though the interactions are very much sensitive to chirality of the particles. Okay. 
Well, the point is that the mass term breaks that gamma phi rotation term, uh, rotation symmetry. Okay, so using that we can. So basically, the chiral transformation that we get, right, acts on psi l and psi r as psi l goes to e to the i alpha times psi l, psi r goes to e to the minus i alpha times psi r. Okay, because gamma phi has eigenvalue one on one, on one and minus one on the other one, right? So this is the transformation under the chiral transformation. And now you can see that if you take right something like psi l bar psi r, that picks up a phase of e to the 2 i alpha. Right? So that's why it's not invariant. The mass term, see, if, if you had a psi l bar psi l, right? This is invariant under this transformation. Right? But this is not mass term. Okay? This is identical to 0. The only mass term that you can write down is psi l bar psi r. And this picks up a phase, I mean, to the 2i alpha. Okay, something follows this symmetry, then we cannot write mass term. Exactly. That's right. If something is invariant under this symmetry, okay, then you cannot write a mass term because a mass term is necessarily like psi l bar psi r. Is this? Yes, but it's simply coupling, there's no difference. Right? Because the gluons couple to both left and right hand in the formula. But for SU2, there is a lot of difference. So, in fact, we'll see that when we introduce the fields, they look com completely different, the left hand, right hand one. Mm -hmm. right? It's only at the end of the process that we see that they combine to look like ones. Okay, the non-final ones that we are familiar with. 